I am Jake Stivers. I'm the pastor here at Crossroads Christian Church. If you're new here, I'd like to welcome you and uh, just invite you to be comfortable here today. Or if you've had a struggle getting here, I know a lot of times when <laughs> you have struggles getting to church and overcoming all the battles and everything, um, that's for everybody. And I want you to know you're in a place where you're welcome, you're loved, and the best thing about this place it's not about us, it's about the great I am, and he's here to meet with you today. And I can tell you who I am not, I am not the great I am, I'm not the I am we've been talking about all morning long. I'm so excited to get into this sermon series about I am. It's uh, Jesus proclaimed seven times what he was, he said I am this, and what we don't want you doing is taking our words for who Jesus is, and that's why I'm so excited about this sermon series. If you're venturing in a faith, trying to decide whether you want to follow Jesus or you don't want to follow Jesus, whether you're, you're ready to get invested in this, there's no better place to look and see if Jesus is somebody you want to follow or that's how you want to live your life or you want to put your faith in Jesus. I think there's no better place to start than with the seven I am statements that Jesus made. So over the next five weeks, and you might be adding up math, I did learn math to 10 at least. Yes, we're only going to do five weeks of the I am series. Over the next five weeks, we're going to look in and see what Jesus had to say about his self. Because once again, I don't want you to take my words for it. I'd like for you to take his. Uh, I want to start off today with a little uh, video to illustrate today's sermon. Never, ever, never, ever, never be happy. <gasps> never. Never. Say never. Never. never, never. <gasps> <gasps> Chef, where did you come from? My father banished you 20 years ago. Have you been standing behind that plant this whole time? If only, sire. No, I've been out in the wilderness thinking of nothing but how I let you down. If only there was some way I could make you feel better. Well, fat chance. The only way I'll ever be happy is by eating a troll, and that ain't gonna happen thanks to you. Ah, but it just might, thanks to me. <gasps> you found the trolls. Ah! So, who all is here familiar with the Trolls movie? Some of us are, some of us aren't. So, I want to give you a little background on the Trolls movie, okay? Those was Bergens that was, uh, they believed, the Bergens believed that the only way they could be happy was to eat a troll because trolls are full of happiness, right? Well, the chef messed up a long time ago and... Um, let the trolls escape. They got off the tree that they, uh, they used to pick them from, and then they would eat them. But if you've watched the movie Trolls, you know that towards the end that they find out that you can't just be happy from eating a troll every once in a while, that happiness is something that comes from the inside. And I wanted to use this clip because I think this is often the way that we pursue happiness is that we think we can devour certain little things every once in a while, and then that makes us happy, right? Like a good piece of cake, right? I mean, you see the good piece of cake laying there. It's pretty. It's beautiful. Uh, you eat it. It makes you happy, and often you eat more of it, more of it, more of it, if you're like me, until, <laughs> until you get... Then you notice that this feeling of happiness that dwelt inside you in your belly has now turned into a feeling of sickness, and hangoverness, and, and the next thing you know, uh, you eat too much cake, too much of this happy cake, and then, then you're unhappy about how you look and how you feel and how well you can chase kids around the house and everything else. So it's interesting that we often pursue happiness in things that leave us wanting more, right? Like a new truck, a new vehicle. I don't know what it's like to own a brand new truck, but I've had some newer trucks before. And at first, they're great. 
they're the best thing on the world. Then after you bump into a few uh, trees out in the wood and your wife scrapes the mailbox up and down your truck and then, then, then your truck's not quite as great and that happiness that you had in your truck at one time, well, you're not that happy about it anymore and, and it's just like this one thing after another. Uh, more and more, if you look, if you kind of take a minute and investigate in your life, you think, man, there's a lot of things, a lot of temporary things that I seek happiness out of that in the end only leaves me wanting more. A lot of times we think a couple drinks, hey, that sounds pretty fun. Everybody who's having a few drinks, they look pretty happy, so let me find my happiness in this. And then a couple drinks turns into a lot of drinks, and then a lot of drinks turns into a late night, and then that late night turns into an early morning because you wake up not feeling happy anymore, do you? Um, often a lot of times in this life, we want to find we think sex, that's such a great thing. Let's have sex, that's going to make us happy, and we're going to find happiness in that. Uh, girls think, oh, this boy, he's so good. He, he makes me so happy about myself. He gives me self-esteem. I get all this, and, and if I just take it to that next level, that will make me even happier than I am now. And then we come together, and, and that happens, and the next morning she goes away feeling empty and alone. And that temporary happiness that she, shot, that she thought she would find, and that is gone. And not only is she not happy no more, not happy about herself, but she feels worse than she did when she started. And it's the same way for guys. We think that'll make us happy, that we'll, we'll satisfy this, this pleasure that's inside of us, this urge inside of us. Uh, so we do something we know we shouldn't do, and we, we jump into this moment of happiness. And then we often go away desiring just more and more of it because it didn't do what we thought it would do. We thought it would create happiness in our lives when it was only happiness for a minute. We as humans in this world, we often seek happiness and things that only leave us wanting more. But I want you, I want you to grab a hold of this statement today. True everlasting happiness, we'll call that joy, okay? True everlasting happiness or joy now, we got a lady named Joy here. I don't advise you go try to eat her like the Bergens was eating the trolls, okay? Not that joy. Joy, true everlasting happiness or joy can only be found when we believe in or follow or put our faith in, however you want to say it, Jesus, all right? Temporary happiness comes from temporary things. I think we just discussed that. But everlasting happiness, it's got to come from something that's everlasting, right? And the only everlasting thing that we know, because we know this earth is on a downhill slide, right? Cake gets bad in a week, okay? Everything that we know besides Jesus is going to pass away, going to perish. Only everlasting happiness or joy can be found when we believe in, have faith in, or follow, however you want to say it, Jesus. And I, there's a story in John chapter 6, not actually a story, it's an event that happened when the apostle John was following Jesus and he thought it was so important so that when people asked him about his life with Jesus, this was one of the stories that he recorded down, that he told them. So this was a huge life event 
for the Apostle John, and it's found in John chapter 6, and I invite you to turn your Bibles there or punch on your phone and follow along with me there. We're going to kind of go through this story, and I want to kind of set some background here for it. Jesus is playing this cat and mouse game, okay? He's, he's going over here and teaching and healing people and meeting their needs, and then he's hopping in a boat and going over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, and then he's doing it over here, and he's seeing if these people will follow him over here. And about the time they all get over here, they, he teaches long enough for one lesson, then he hops back in a boat, boat and goes to the other side. Don't you love the, the humor of Jesus of like, do you want to follow me? Well, here, I'm going to make you follow me across the sea. And it wasn't just real easy to go across the sea back then. You had to pay or row a boat or do something like that. So, so Jesus is playing this cat and mouse game with all these people, going back and forth across this sea. And it comes to a point where there's about 5,000 men, 5,000 men who are following him, okay? That's not counting the women or children. So let's just say that there was a very, very large group had began to follow Jesus around. And Jesus, he, he does this. He crosses the sea with his disciples and all these people falling behind him. And he goes up on this mountain and sets down. And he's got his disciples here. I just picture him sitting on this big mountain. He's kind of sitting there lounging on a rock. I got a comfy chair and disciples there. And he kind of looks up. And he sees this large crowd of at least 5,000 men plus women and children. Then verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him. Jesus said to Philip, okay, now get this. Here comes this huge crowd following us so these guys have been traveling all over the place they ain't got a bunch of food they don't have backpacks with camelbacks and water and food and mris and freeze-dried food and everything else in there they have nothing they're coming across here so he lifts his eyes up he sees all these people because passover which was a feast they celebrated passover jews celebrated passover with feast it's like going to a Super Bowl, celebrating Super Bowl without chicken wings for me, right? You've got to have buffalo wings when you, buffalo wings, cheese dip, little smokies, leftover barbecue ribs from yesterday. That's the stuff you've got to have when you celebrate Super Bowl, all right? Who's having, who's going to go watch? I know not, I know not everybody's going to go watch the Super Bowl today, but who's going to go watch the Super Bowl and not have food? Nobody. This was like Passover, okay? You didn't celebrate Passover without food. So when Jesus says this, when he looks up at Philip and says, how are we going to feed all these people? This was with <laughs> this presupposition behind him of like, we've got to have food, okay? Not inviting them over to the Super Bowl without food. We're not having them come over here and celebrate Passover with us without food, and uh, Philip looks up, sees all the people, and he looks over. Jesus says, 200 denarii, okay? A denarii was about a day's wages for an average laborer. So 200 out of 360, we're going to say about two-thirds or three-quarters of a year's worth of labor. Would not buy enough bread to feed all these people. And it's not like he says this, and what are you going to do? You going to go to the hostess store around the corner? You going to go to the bread store around the corner in Capernaum and, and find a bunch of bread to feed? You can't. One, we don't have the money to buy this food, Jesus. You know, I think this is what's behind Philip. Two to hundred denarii wouldn't even fill, feed these people. Philip's looking back at Jesus like, we ain't got close to enough money to feed all these people. And even if we was going to do that, there's nowhere to buy that much bread. There's nowhere to buy that much bread. So I, I appreciate the realistic, realistic banter that's going on between all these. And then Andrew speaks up. Andrew was a smart aleck. Okay? Look what he says. He says, here's a boy 
with five loaves of bread and two fish. I don't see what good that's going to do. You know, like, like here, here's a six-piece order of chicken wings at a huge Super Bowl party. What's that going to do? And that's just going to make everybody mad. You know, so he's like, here, Jesus, here's a boy with a couple pieces of bread and a couple fish. Do that. And Jesus, man, you got to love Jesus. He says, just have him sit down. He's got these guys all worked up, all, all messed up, pressure and stress of how are we going to feed these people. And he's just like, just have him sit down. Just have him sit down. So he takes the, the fish and the bread and he blesses them. And not only is there enough to feed everybody there, it tells us not only is there enough to feed everybody there, Jesus has them go around with baskets and collect all the fragments, okay? So here's these guys that were saying, here's a couple loaves of bread, Jesus. What are you going to do with that? What are we going to do? We don't even have enough money to do that. Jesus says, hey, boys, go grab your baskets and pick up everything that's left over. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you who Jesus is. And they go and they pick up. All these different pieces of bread and this goes, and the people, man, once they're fed and they've had this feast, they go, this indeed is the prophet who's came down to us. This indeed is him. They're like really realizing something about Jesus here, and they kind of make an uproar, and they're like, it's time to make him king. And Jesus with his ninja skills, yes, Jesus has ninja skills. You can find out several times in the Bible where Jesus just like, is in a large crowd, and there's an uproar, and he slides to the back where nobody can find him. Jesus, with his ninja skills, sees what's going on, and he knows it's not time for him to be presented yet. So he slips back up the mountain, disappears, goes off to himself, probably to pray about them knucklehead disciples that's following him all the time and won't believe him that he's going to feed all these people with a few loaves of bread and a few fishes. We don't know what he does. He just disappears. And evening comes, and his disciples hop in a boat. They're going back. They're sticking with the game plan of like, okay, we'll see if all these people follow us over there. I don't know why. But they, they hop in the boat to go to the other side of the sea. They don't know where Jesus is at. The people, the big group got left behind. They're going over to the other side of the sea. Jesus is nowhere. A huge storm comes up. A huge storm comes up. The waves are rough. The disciples says they're all scared for their life. And here comes Jesus walking on the water. And he tells them, don't be afraid. And all of a sudden, they're boom, they're at the beach, you know. They're landed. Man, if you'd seen all these things, don't you know, don't you think feeding all those people, doing all these miracles, working all these things in these people's lives, calming the seas, getting them over there, slipping out of a crowd, wouldn't you think you knew who Jesus was? Don't you think you know who he was when he would say, I am They don't. So all the people had crossed. All the, or the disciples had crossed. The next day, the people wake up and realize Jesus and the disciples are nowhere found. So they scatter around. They find boats. They go across seeking Jesus. And this is where it gets real good. And I want you to pay real close attention to is in verse 25. says, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, and truly, truly, it's like surely, surely, when anytime Jesus, anytime you find this in Scripture, if you're kind of wondering about Jesus and going to get into Scripture and learn more about him, anytime you see when he says truly, truly, he don't do that because he had a stutter. 
He did it because he wanted you to pay attention. It's like, listen up, here comes some big thing I'm fixing to drop on you. I need you to pay attention. Listen up. So he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, feeding a bunch of people with almost nothing, walking on water, calming the seas. You didn't see none of, you're not seeking me because you've seen what I've done. You're seeking me because you ate your fill of loaves, of the loaves. You're seeking me because you fed on some trolls or you fed on some temporary happiness. You're not seeking me because who I am. You're seeking me because of what I did for you. And he tells them here, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which is the Son of Man, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, what must be we be doing to do the works of God? And Jesus answered on them. Okay, he said, surely, surely, listen up. Here it comes. I want you to know, what, here, here it comes, church. Here's the works of God that you must do. And Jesus answers them and says, this is the work of God. That you believe in, that you believe in him who has sent me. That you believe in. And I don't want to get into a whole other sermon, but I want you to take attention. I want you to take particular attention to the word believe. Okay? It also tells us in the Bible that Satan knows who Jesus is. And I'll promise you right now, Satan believes Jesus and who he is. And he knows who the I am is. All right? When he says believes here, it's not just merely acknowledging that Jesus existed and even that he died on a cross for my sins so that I could be saved. There's a lot more to believing in Jesus than just saying, oh, I believe there was a guy that Pat lived in the past that died for my... There's a lot more to that. What's Jesus having them do? Follow him across the sea. Follow him everywhere. When I say believe in, you could put follow him. You could put, put your faith in. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says that um, we are saved by grace through faith in him. So, so Jesus says, church, he says, disciples, he says, crowd of 5,000, here's the work that God has you to do. That's to believe in, put your faith in, follow me in all that you do. And this is where they get all knuckleheaded. So they say, so what sign do you do that we should believe? What? Come on. You just fed us with a few loaves of bread and a couple fishes. Do you need another sign? Huh? What, what more do you want? Jesus told them at the first of this passage, it's not, you're not here because of the sign that I've already done in front of you. You're here because you ate of the bread. And they start to get in this conversation with Jesus about what sign. And he tells them about the greatest sign that the, the tribe of Israel had ever experienced. Where Jesus, where God, when, when his, Moses had led the Jews out of Egypt and had them in the wilderness. And there was nothing to eat. That it, God sent manna bread, angel bread, down from above every day. So that they would have something to eat. Not only... Here's what gets me about this, okay? They thought that was a sign then. Jesus fed them with a few loaves and breads, and they, they couldn't, there was, they could not take of the leftovers. When Jesus does it here, not only does he have the sign, does he perform the miracle, he leaves something with them. He leaves them with the baskets and the extra fish and the extra bread and everything else because the manna would disappear. He said back then they could only eat that day, that morning, what they needed. And then it disappeared. Jesus did a sign in front of them so great, filled all of them, 5,000 men plus women and children. He left. He left bread and fish with them so they wouldn't forget the sign. And here they are the next day going, we need a sign, Jesus. And he says, forget about this, Ed. He says, for, 
For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives us life to the world. And they say to him, okay, okay, sir, give us this bread. Give us this bread that we need so much. And he says, I am the bread of life. Jesus says to him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall not, never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. They've seen these miracles that he's worked in their life. He, they've seen these signs. And so he goes out and he goes right to them. I am the bread of life. I am everlasting. Everlasting can be found in me and me alone. Not in bread or fish or anything that's going to perish or, or trucks or, or acts of pleasure or anything else. Because all that's going away. All that is temporary. All that is going to disappear. But Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And you've seen my signs, but you've seen me and you've not believed. They're so focused on these temporary things that only make them have joy for very brief moments. I wouldn't even say joy. Moments of happiness that they can't see right in front of them, the bread of life. They're so distracted by material things in their life that they can't see Jesus on a cross right in front of them. And they start to grumble down here in 41. It says, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph? They're, Jesus, he can't be everlasting bread of life. We know this guy. He comes from Joseph and Mary. He's from Bethlehem. They start to let the world influence how they're thinking and how they're reacting to Jesus so that they're focused on these things. Well, we know Jesus. He, we know where he came from. We, we knew him when he was growing up. Super great carpenter. He'd even go in the synagogues and teach at a very a super great guy, but we know him. How can he be the bread of life? How can he be sent down from God? Even though They've seen the same Jesus that they knew all their lives. Even though they've seen him work these miracles. Remember, they was following him because he was healing people. Making the lame to walk, the blind to see, taking demons out of people's lives. They've seen him doing all this. They've seen him feed all these people. They've seen all these signs, but they say, oh, no, that can't be right. We know him. We know where he's from. We know that little town he came from. And the sad part's found in verse 60, because you can see that they're, they're beginning to be more and more distracted by these, these things. They're trying to put logic to everything. They're trying to trying to figure all this out, and they're getting farther and away. And it says, so when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. How can they listen to it? Because Jesus said, I'm the bread of life so much that you're going to have to eat of my body and drink of my blood. You're going to have to feast on me. You're going to have to find your happiness in me. And they're like, that's kind of hard to do. Nobody wants to go over and take a bite out of Jesus. Just like the first time a Bergen takes a troll, he spits it back out. didn't really taste that good. He's like, I don't know why we can find happiness in this. So this, they got more and more confused. So Jesus goes, don't, don't you know? Can't you get it? Can't you see what I'm going to do? You've heard the prophets. You've heard everybody talk about me. You've heard everybody say what's going to happen to me. You've seen these signs. All this, don't you know? It's worse in verse 66. It says, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, do you want me to go away as well? 
looked at his best friends. You want me to go away too? Simon Peter, Simon or Peter, or Simon Peter, whatever you want to call him, answered him. Because he knew. He knew something that the rest of the crowd just wasn't getting. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed. We have followed. We have put our faith in you. We trusted you when the boat came. We have followed you from sea to sea, from town to town. We've went in places we don't like. We've done, we've believed in you. We have followed you. We have put our faith in you and have come to know. And have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. It's easy to look back on a people and say, they, that was, how could they not see Jesus right in front of their face? It's easy to look back and say, how could they not know Jesus they were Jewish. They were God's people. They was, they was taught, let me tell you something. Your average Jew knew more scripture than I ever will or anybody in here ever will. They was well versed in the Old Testament, not only in the laws, but in the prophets too. They knew about who was coming. So if people have been taught, known about, see Jesus, work all these miracles, it's easy for us to sit back and look and say, how could they not see Jesus right in front of them? Well, I want to say to you today that even though you've been in church and even though you may have been taught in the scriptures and everything else, that you may not see the Jesus that's right. In, you may not see I am. You may not know who Jesus truly is. You may have been in church 60 years and may not know, may not have followed, may not have believed in, may not have put your faith in, I am. It could happen to us as easy as it happened to you. True happiness, joy, can only be found when we believe in and follow Jesus. What things in this world have you sought out, have you believed in, have you followed that would give you true happiness, that you thought would give you happiness, that only have, only have end up causing you more pain as we talked about? What, what things? I want you right now to search what things in your life have you put more in than you have into following Jesus, putting your faith in Jesus, from actually believing in Jesus? What temporary things, man? What things in your life is keeping you from following Jesus or putting your faith in Jesus more, believing in Jesus? Man, I... If there's one person in here that says, I ain't got one of those things, you're probably lying. If not, you're better than I am. One thing I learned this week, there are several things as I study this summer that I put more into, or this week, I'm ready for summer, the warm weather today, just getting there, all right? I found out, I had to, I had to search my heart, Jake, what things are you putting more in for this temporary happiness that won't make a difference. Fixing up my truck because I've torn my truck up. Bought a nice truck several years ago. And recently I was like, man, I think I might want a new truck. And I'm like, no, I don't want to get back into truck payments. Those stink. So I'll just fix my, my truck up. This will make me happy about it again. Guess what's going to happen five years or ten years from now? That truck's going to be a piece of junk probably because I'll beat the tar out of it by then. First truck I ever owned, 71 Chevy, I remember. My grandpa bought it from his sister. I thought that was the greatest truck in the whole wide world. Blue, white, you could power stall that thing on a concrete bridge on the south side of Peoria like no other. It wasn't very long. 
I wasn't happy with that thing anymore. I sold it off, and it's been a list of trucks. And as I look back this week, I thought, in the early 90s, I had a full-size Chevy truck that had heat and air, got me from point A to B, got about 12 miles a gallon, and I thought it was a pretty cool truck. Fast forward yourself to 2018, I got a full-size Chevy truck with heat in there, gets you from places to point A to B, gets about one or two more gallons to the mile. Now, I'm no more happy with this truck than I was in that. So I want to ask you today, what in your life, because I know there's things there, it may be a truck, I don't know, you're going to have to discover that out yourself. What in your life are you seeking out that's keeping you from following Jesus more, believing in Jesus more, putting your faith in Jesus more. I want to ask you this question too. Will you quit following or believing in Jesus when you don't agree with what he has to say about these temporary things that waste away? Will you be like the people in this story who when it came down to, we've got to follow Jesus, we've got to... If Jesus says, take a bite out of me, you better take a bite out of him. They couldn't get past that, couldn't figure it out. What things in your life, when Jesus has something to say about it, it's going to cause you to follow him less. When he says something about sex, when he says this is something that's to be done inside wedlock, between one man and one woman, is that going to cause you to quit following Jesus? Are you going to turn away? When he says something about money, when he lays it on your heart to give like like he says to in the Bible or to do something like he does in the Bible, is that going to cause you to quit following him? Do you think there's not things that's going to make people turn away from following Jesus today the same as there was 2,000 years ago? I'm here to tell you that we live in the same world as they do. Looks a little bit different, but there's going to be people that quit following Jesus because they find something out, something that he said in the Bible and turn away because they don't want to give that temporary happiness thing up that just causes us turmoil and pain in the long run. If a band would like to come up. What I want you to know, what I want you to know when you leave here today, if you believe in, follow, or put your faith in Jesus, you can be filled on the inside with a joy like you've never experienced before. If you put your faith in, if you follow or believe in Jesus, You can experience a pure joy on the inside like like you've never heard before. You can, let me tell you something about sex and marriage and all this stuff Jesus says to have about it. It happens. There's a joy that comes in having a beautiful Christian marriage that you'll never experience, that you never think you could even have, that will will fill you with love. There's There's a joy you can have when you've got money mastered, that it's no longer controlling you, but you're following what Jesus says, and you're doing with it, and you'll learn no longer you're not serving money, but money serves you, and you put it here and there, and it's always taken care of, and that there's more important things than these material things in your life. There's a there's a guy. A, There's a bread that you can eat in that'll fill you with so much joy and happiness that you can lose a loved one and and still make it through. Still walk out on the other side and see his greater plan in it. As we go in this time of invitation, I ask you to stand up. And maybe you're just starting to make a decision about Jesus. Maybe you're thinking, whoa, this is some crazy stuff he talked about today, and I'm just not sure about that. That doesn't mean this isn't the place for you. I wouldn't tell you to, i tell you not to, not to, not to go away, not, not to stay at home next time. I'd tell you, come back. Bear with us. Learn a little bit more about who Jesus says he is. Investigate a little more. Feast a little bit more on Jesus. And just see. Just see, just 
Just try it for once. Talking to Jesus, praying with Jesus, maybe opening up the Bible and find out for yourself a little bit more about who Jesus is. So if you're new and you're making questions and some things I said really flipped your wig today, don't run off just yet. Hang in there. Don't take it from my words. Look in here. Find out who who Jesus is telling you in. He is. Because he's saying to you today, I'm the bread of life. And maybe you're far, you've went farther than that. You've been following Jesus, but you've been turned away. I'd say, hey, do what I did this week and pray and ask for ask for God, ask the Holy Spirit to show you these things that were I'm following for all my own temporary happiness or or have him to expose these things. How have I turned away from Jesus? How have I quit following him? How have I quit putting my faith in him? Maybe it's something to do with money or relationships or whatever it is. Meet with him. Get who he says he is on this, not me. Father, as we come to you today, I ask that you use the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes and our hearts to what you've had to tell us today. That we could we could go this into this time and really search our souls and our hearts and, and things that we've never thought of or would surprise us that we've been investing more in than what we've been investing in you. That, that maybe we've been saying that we believed in you, but we've not really put our faith in you and started to follow you. Father, would you expose these these secrets or these darknesses that are in our heart today? Bring them to light so that we could hand them over to you, repent and turn towards you, put our faith in you and follow you closer, Father. Forgive us for when we fall short. Create in us a, a new heart that has joy in all circumstances. Father, I love you and I thank you for first and foremost for your son Jesus and what he did on the cross for our sins